Okay, so um, well done on completing the first chapter, looking at um, the introduction to globalization and the introduction to pandemics. This second chapter is where we now start to move on to think about the unique elements of this virus, um, where the virus came from uh, and how it spread subsequently before moving on to think about the different distribution of the virus. Um, one of the key aspects of this chapter is that with a live uh, pandemic as we have, or an ongoing pandemic as we have at the moment, um, all of the data is constantly changing. And that's one of the beauties of doing these kind of dynamic projects, but it does mean we have to keep um, changing and, and, uh, and updating our sources. So all this data was collected on the 17th of April. You're, you're going to be kind of shared with you or before. Um, however, by the time you're accessing this, things are likely to have changed. So it's important to use the web links both on the website and embedded into this Google site to um, have a look at the updated versions. Um, so here's where we are on the 17th of April. We've got over 2 million confirmed cases and, and getting on up to 150,000 deaths, although you know, nearly half a million people have now recovered from this. Now, I suppose another element that we will touch on um, later on in this chapter is to think about the reliability of these statistics. It's really quite difficult um, to report on any of these until we really, the pandemic ends and, and we can start to get a kind of much clearer picture um, on these. Now, because obviously this, all of this data depends on testing, depends on reporting. Um, so we've got to you know, just be kind of conscious about the, both the accuracy and the reliability uh, of the data sources we're seeing. Um, so with this, we're going to start thinking about um, the different growth and where this virus came from. I've put a few links here. Um, one of the kind of main ones you might want to, to be using though, and one of the ones the government's referring to quite a lot, is this John Hopkins, which are pulling together data uh, from all over the world. This is really interesting for you to be able to see live or, or as live as can be um, cases, country by country. Uh, so we've got deaths, cases, um, as well as testing. This is just for the US, but you can toggle, toggle between. Um, you can have a look at, at the different graphs and yeah, play around with, with how that is all displayed for you. Um, I guess finally, when we're thinking about our reports, some of you may want to start having a look at data yourself. Um, way back in, in February, when this sort of start to, be, to become more of a global issue. Um, within our geography department at Sydney, we thought it might be quite interesting to look at this uh, as an introduction to a course a module on China. Um, and this data was just copy and pasted from that John Hopkins website into a uh, Google Sheet, which, is, which I've made available for you on the website. So you can create your own graphs. Here we can see one from February, one updated, uh, today on the 17th. So you can just copy and paste that data straight from the case here, just by highlighting it all, copy and paste it in, um, then selecting the data, insert chart, and it will produce the graph just as you see them here. Um, so where did this virus come from? Uh, to our best, to scientists' best understanding at the moment, they think that this virus is something that um, evolved or developed in bats, um, uh, you know, and, and as part of kind of human nature, as we continue to push the boundaries and and go into and uh, these kind of new territories, new regions, you know, and we, we come into more direct contact with with wildlife, and um, you know. There's, there's a lot of links there between, between us finding more and more of these potential outbreaks. Um, bats have a unique sort of system that allows them to be uh, quite good carriers, hosts for these viruses, whilst they themselves remain immune, immune to these. Um, there's a, one strain of research that thinks that these bats were first transported to live food markets, uh, which are quite common across Asia. Um, and again, highlights the kind of different cultural norms that we can experience around the world and the different cultural uh, kind of 
I suppose, elements that are yet to assimilate between Eastern and Western and Asian and European and North American cultures. But, you know, right across Asia, these live food markets remain much more common. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons we see these. But these bats potentially were taken into a live food market um, where the virus was then able to transfer maybe into another mammal, which was more similar to humans, where it could evolve again, possibly pangolins, um, or directly transfer um, from the bat into a human, maybe someone handling it, which was then able to be transferred um, it, to others. They, they, the WHO, who's responsible for this sort of thing, and um, the global organization, they traced this back to the live food, the, the fish food market um, in Wuhan in China, which they believe to be the kind of center of this epidemic. Now, this is a picture that was shared quite widely on, on social media. I don't have the original source for it. Um, taken in that live food market. And I suppose, again, it shows those kind of cultural differences um, we, we experience around the world. And, uh, and you can see here highlighted um, some of the different kind of elements that could make this quite uh, an attractive place for a virus and quite somewhere that the viruses could quite easily spread and transfer through to in humans. Um, so, so from Wuhan, China, um, that, those first cases of the, the virus were sort of known about really at the end of December, 31st December or so was when the, this was uh, the WHO sort of started investigating and China first um, discovered this with it being reported as a case of pneumonia, the virus. Um, from there, by the by 22nd of January, had um, started to kind of expand in its range, its kind of reach. It's not a, not a, certainly not a pandemic yet at this stage, uh, more of an epidemic, kind of with nearly all of the cases, bar one, um, remaining in that Southeast Asia. Um, so cases throughout Japan, and we can see there on the by the 22nd of January, in total, there are only 555 cases worldwide. Um, by the sort of same point in March, so if we fast forward just kind of two months, we can really see that now the cases have increased to 31,000 cases a day, um, over 300,000 cases in total. And this is now much more of a pandemic. It was actually the 11th of February when this was named as a, as a pandemic. Um, and, and we can sort of start to get a sense of how, you know, the, the traveling of people allow, allow, and allow this virus to um, move from country to country. And if we think back to those kind of, all those global connections we looked at in the first chapter, we can really kind of understand why it was able to spread so quickly. Um, WHO has done an excellent timeline of how this is kind of played out, which is uh, available for you by following the link up in the top corner here. However, here we can see the, the exponential growth in the COVID curve. So we can see how um, you know, this was sort of first um, named on February 11th, and then from then it's had this uh, slow growth period at first before rapidly increasing um, towards the middle of March and throughout April. And that's just known as exponential growth um, because this R number is above one. It means that for every one, if it's you know, around two, for every one person, it passed on to two, two then passes on you know, to, to each of those to two more, to two more, so we've got this kind of doubling, uh, if not higher, um, spread of the disease. Now, these graphs have been much, much more widely shared, being on the, the UK briefings, and, and there's an excellent source of these from the Financial Times, so I do encourage you to see where we're at at the moment. But this is again where the kind of geography comes in, because you know, looking at these with a geographer's perspective, we start to kind of question, well, there's a huge discrepancy in the trends between countries. Okay, so we have this upward curve, and yes, there's, there's differences based on the size of the countries, but you know, they're not all following the same pattern, and and that's where you know we need to start understanding what's going on within these countries, what's the different systems that mean we have these differences, and 
And, you know, how do countries like South Korea, who have this flat curve, quite desirable flat curve, um, what are they doing differently? What is, what is it about them that, that differs to countries like the US and the UK that have this much steeper trajectory? You know, similarly, Germany, um, you know, on a scale with, of the UK in terms of population, in terms of, to some extent, um, with these big industrial cities and, and also an economically developed country, you know, why is it that they're seeing a different response to the UK? Um, so that's where you know, we really need to start understanding the geography to, to begin to start understanding how, how and why these different countries are experiencing different trends. This is another way of, of kind of viewing the, the, the explosion, if you like, the exponential growth of this virus. And we can really see here the dominance of the developed, globalized, switched on countries with America, kind of almost one third of the daily deaths, and, and Europe, and particularly Spain, Italy, and the UK, um, making up a kind of sizable um, proportion of those as well. So again, these are all available for you on the Financial Times to have a look and hopefully they'll be, I'll continue to update these so you can see how this develops from when I'm producing this on the 17th to, to when you're able to, to view and access this data. Um, and again, we can highlight the, the difference in the case fatality to CFR um, levels. Um, and you can see there is a, again, a huge discrepancy here between Italy where 11% of infected cases, infected people uh, are not making it, compared to Germany, where it's way down at, at 1%. Um, so again, this is where we need to start applying our kind of geographer's perspective. So here's just a handful of the, the reasons for this different CFR uh, fatality rate um, between countries. Um, and I suggested here, you might wanna copy and paste these points into a Google Doc or into a document or even jot them down quickly and then just kind of annotate them and, and consider, maybe make some reasons to, 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 to use later on in your research or to refer back to. So our first one, reliability of the data collection. You know, that's something you think about your, your geography field work. I suppose we're talking on a much larger scale here, but different countries are report are collecting and reporting this data in different ways and um, we from the uk uh, daily briefings you may be aware that the uk data the data comes from hospital deaths which so it's been a lot of criticism but maybe it's excluding uh, deaths within the community deaths within care homes which could be quite sizable and um, whereas later on you know, there's the the death certificates and they're reported in the Office of National Statistics by the ONS. But again, that's um, some of those are, are kind of unknowns or it's best guesses or it's not always clearly reported. And, and that differs to country to country. So, get it, so you know, with, with all of that data, we've got to kind of take it with a pinch of salt and, and think about, okay, well, how, how reliable has the data collection and how has the data been collected within that country? And, Arguably the most important element is the testing itself, but especially with those confirmed cases, we'll see uh, in the next module that testing varies hugely between countries. So countries carrying out higher numbers of tests are likely to find a lower case fatality rate because they're able to test people who are maybe help more young, fit and healthy and are able to recover Whereas in some cases, they may be, someone like Italy may just be testing those who are the most vulnerable or those who are hospitalized. Therefore, there's going to be, it's not it's going to kind of follow on that there's going to be a higher fatality rate. So the amount of testing and who those testing um, kits are made available to is going to have a huge impact on the data at this stage of the pandemic. Some more other kind of geographical factors, you know, population density and the population structure are hugely going to impact uh, how this virus transmits um, and then how, again, how vulnerable people are. So if we're in a really dense population, somewhere like London and New York, which are kind of now seen as two of the kind of key centers for this pandemic, 
with high population densities, it's much harder for those kind of social distancing and isolation measures to, to be as effective as they could be somewhere like New Zealand or Iceland with a much, much lower population density as well as population um, total as well. The structure of a population refers to um, the number of children, adults and, and elderly. So again, we would expect to find in a country with, a, with an aging population, um, a higher death rate, like higher case fatality rate, um, as they're potentially more vulnerable um, to this. However, on the flip side, I suppose, when we consider the healthcare, we might find a country of, like Japan or Germany with, or even Italy with these aging populations, they are maybe more geared up to deal with um, healthcare within the elderly. Um, but the healthcare system is going to play a huge part. You know, the NHS uh, is, is kind of widely regarded globally as, as a really incredible healthcare system with free public healthcare available to everyone and non discriminatory. Um, countries that have more private healthcare may find it harder to adapt but also the one of the things that's been reported on a lot is the number of critical bed or ICU units intensive care units available and um, there's been quite a lot in the in the press about Britain's kind of low ratio of beds to people uh, compared to somewhere like Germany which has much much higher percentage of number of ICU beds compared to the number of people. So the, the number of hospitals, the number of uh, the capacity, as well as the ability of that healthcare system is going to impact on the fatality rate. Uh, you know, even simple things like the number of ventilators uh, available is, is going to have a huge impact. And um, next we can think about the political structure. Now, this is quite a, a complex concept in many ways but if we have a political structure which is more autocratic which means more government top-down control with people um, more likely to follow those rules and, and and the kind of mandates passed down by the government there has been um, commentary that that's being able to deal with the virus better than more democratic systems where it's much harder to enforce a lockdown to enforce this um, kind of situation. Another uh, element that links in with political structure is the idea of centralised versus devolved governments. Germany have a much more devolved government with each state and region able to kind of take responsibility and make decisions in its own interest, which has been linked with potentially higher testing and um, and faster, more agile decision making, whereas in countries like the UK, where it's, more, where it's much more centralised, it does it means it's taking a lot longer to coordinate as those kind of logistical um, processes and the decision making is is much is potentially much slower. Um, and that links in with this speed of response. You know, how quickly were people able to scale up the testing? Were people able to get the um, medical equipment they needed were people and particularly how quickly were the restrictions like the lockdown um, enforced you know there's undoubtedly there'll be a um, investigation into the government's response to this and that'll be I think a key question is did they react quick fast enough uh, in order to prevent the maximum number of deaths they could or minimize the number of deaths um, and then we've got the type of response, which we'll touch on heavily in the next um, video, looking at you know, did they enforce full quarantine, house you know, lockdowns, or was it more of a curfew system? Was it um, all businesses shut, or was it just those uh, some businesses that were encouraged to work from home? So we'll have a look at the type of response in the next video. That's an important factor to consider. And then lastly, is level of economic development. So far, we've seen from the data that this is mainly being reported in the more economically developed countries. One of the interesting elements and elements we need to really hope doesn't kind of come to fruition is that this virus um, sees huge 
increases in less economically developed countries, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, um, potentially huge spikes in South America or, or um, Asia, Asian countries it's not yet reached, where they don't have anything like the same level of economic resources to throw into managing this. And that's a, again, an interesting area for, for some independent research um, in the subsequent lessons. So I suppose that's a really, really quick overview into where this virus uh, kind of initiated or was conceived and going right through to why we, we're seeing these different um, kind of curves and different um, responses to the virus kind of globally. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you.